Since the death of Owl, and honestly, even a little bit before, we've seen a lot of people come forth and release some juicy details to the public that otherwise would have remained private. With there being no league or team they're associated with to punish them, there's no repercussions for their actions. They can leave it all out there and have their own unfiltered opinion about stuff that happened within the league and their experience and answer questions as well. And since it all started, so many people have come up to me saying, have you seen this podcast, this AMA stream, this guy said this, that guy said this, blah blah blah. And in all honesty, most of the time the answer to that is yes. But I figured, now that we have a lot of compelling information all in one blurb, that we could do a recap of sorts for the people who may have missed out on it or looking to catch up. Now, do keep in mind there might be a couple of key things I miss here and there. I'm not perfect. It's a lot of information to process. And there's always a possibility I missed out on an individual completely who did a stream or went on a podcast, but maybe didn't get the same public perception as these other guys. And if that is the case, I apologize. And I encourage you to leave who they are down in the comments below and some of the big information that you learned about them. If you want to know all of the stuff that they talked about in these streams or podcasts, I will leave a link to every single summary or or video in the description. But for now, here is a compilation of all things that I have heard about that have gone down with juice and leaks from the end of Owl until the present February 1st. I really hope you enjoy. The first place I'd like to start with is the AMA streams, and a major shout out needs to go to those who are willing to make these concise, bulleted lists on Reddit and Twitter and whatnot. I appreciate you guys. So for the first guy I'd like to start with, I thought it'd be appropriate to go with Gator, a pretty prominent figure within this community and a polarizing one at that, but someone who does have a lot of different opinions and good information. Where to start with Gator? Well, one compelling thing that I wanted to throw in there is that in his words, a lot of Owl teams actually wanted to stay, but Blizzard and the League gave some BS terms and conditions for them to stay, and it just wasn't worth it, hence why most teams decided to just take the agreement and leave. But then, of course, we have the bombshell that he dropped about a lot of teams actually in consistent trade talks with one another, something that I didn't think I'd hear, just because in recent years, trades have been so rare to see in Owl. They never, ever come up. But for Atlanta in particular, there was this one situation where Boston inquired about trading for Vigilante and Donghack, and Atlanta in return would get Smurf, Twilight, and Striker. In the end, Gator would end up saying no to this trade, and that was that, but you can only imagine what could have happened if something like this went down, as Smurf would probably be a notable upgrade over Donghack just knowing his flexibility, and Twilight would be a good option to at the very least have off the bench, but I guess Gator didn't want Striker, among some other logistical issues, which is why he ended up saying no. It really makes you think, though. And in terms of Vigilante and whether he could get another opportunity, Gator actually asked him what he wanted to do if he wanted to go to a different team, but Vigilante said he would prefer to stay, and in a lot of instances, he was helping on the coaching side while riding the bench, so at least he had some kind of role on this team, and it's cool to know that he was at least interested in staying, despite us feeling bad for him getting no playtime. Some other cool info he dropped about the 2023 season was that, for one, they were beating the Mayhem consistently in scrims during the playoffs, once again showing that they were very prepared for the Mayhem, but maybe not so much the other teams. If they were beating those guys a lot and they made it to the finals, it makes you wonder what could have happened. But also, the Reign in general could have had a very different looking team. Aside from that Boston stuff and wanting someone, I guess, originally Gator wanted to keep Kai on his team as the hitscan before eventually trading for Lip. I believe he had brought this up in a previous interview, maybe it was with Yiska or somebody else, but the point is he initially had Kai in the plans before the Lip trade came into fruition, but also he wanted to have Sugar Free join this team, and he had a big interest in Junbin to be the tank player. It really seems more and more like Dong Hak was a last resort option, and they just didn't have any other choices as teams weren't willing to give up their guy for a good price, or in this instance, they just couldn't get Junbin to come to them in free agency. Despite having the better contract offer and the better buyout offer with O2 Blast, the shock in his words just didn't let it happen. I guess the players and the coaches convinced him to go there, and that was that. Supposedly, Gator also wanted to have both Mikey and Reiner on the team at some point, but... 
both of those fell through, and even considered having Jakaro join the team before eventually settling on Donghak. It's interesting to see that he was willing to go with so many other more experienced options before eventually settling on Donghak. And one last nugget of information I wanted to go over from that stream had to do with Dako from Atlanta Rain in 2019. If you were around back then, you know that this guy was in the headlines constantly. He was a good player, but there was a lot of drama internally between him and the Atlanta Rain. There was a big report about it that happened at the time, and then he got dropped, and Defran even called him out a couple of months ago on stream. And essentially, Gator confirmed all of the rumors and the things that Defran said as well. He straight up said his least favorite teammate was Dako. He was a good person, he loved him, but he was emotional and he was lazy. He did not want to scrim. And that aligns up perfectly with what Defran has said as well, where the guy simply did not feel like playing, he trolled, he didn't want to be there, he just wanted to play on stage, and his heart was not in it. There's a boatload of other interesting stuff and personal opinions that Gator had, so I definitely recommend checking out the synopsis on that, and even the VOD if it's still available, it's some good stuff. And the same's going to apply for this next person, Hydron, the man who has been burning bridges left and right since he went on that AMA stream. Oh my lord, there's a lot. Buckle in. He talked a lot of smack about Gunba, the head coach of the Florida Mayhem. He said that he has never liked this guy. He is toxic and generally a terrible person. And it all started back during preseason when he would threaten apparently to kick Hydron off the team for responding too late to messages. And he threatened to kick him off the team for being too involved with the American Tornado Discord and talking to his former teammates too much. If that wasn't enough, supposedly the practicing conditions were very harsh, going from 11 a.m. until 1 a.m. on certain days, and that Gunba even encouraged his players to be taking Adderall to their faces. And he was also told by Gunba himself that he would never play again once they got Exy. Obviously, that didn't last long, but that's pretty crazy. And apparently, when things weren't going well, Gumba would screech and slam his desk when they'd be losing a scrim, and apparently every player who has ever played with Gunba hated him. And from there, it just keeps on going, saying that Gunba could be really backhanded, saying stuff like Majed was the next best Lucio, then flaming the hell out of him, and then while he was benched for Exy, Hydron would be working his butt off in scrims every day, while apparently Exy would be playing from his apartment just to smoke cigarettes and sleep all day. And just to top it all off, he claimed Gumba's racist. That kind of does it for the Gunba section, at least for now. We will touch on him more very soon, don't you worry. But now we should touch base on some more general Florida knowledge that he had. A couple of things went down in Season 5 that I thought were interesting. One was that he tried to get the team to sign Iron rather than Adam. I doubt that he would have played either because someone was so good, but I digress. Apparently, they also tried to trade Majed for Khan. That would have been interesting. And on top of it, they tried trading himself for Aspire. And in Season 6, according to him and what he's learned, the Mayhem tried to trade RuPaul for both Teru and and Babel, which is insane to think about just knowing how good RuPaul would be for this Florida team by the time they won the title. And if you're wondering how Hydron's career could have been different, he went over that, saying all of the teams he got offers from throughout his two years, that being Florida, Vancouver, Boston, Toronto, and Houston at one point or another. So there's a potential world where he maybe could have gone to any one of these teams, and who knows how the rest of his career goes. He also touched base on the Team USA flop, saying that the reason Kaluj wasn't in the game was because he was not the leader type of player, and that Super was in to play SIG after the loss to KSA because he was just a much better leader and he had more confidence, and he believes that Team USA amongst that also played bad for things like their support issues, amongst a couple of other things. And lastly, it doesn't have to do with OWL or with the World Cup or anything, but he talked about a couple of other interesting details that I had to throw in there. One being that Korean players are not nearly as innocent as the fans make them out to be, and that supposedly 80% of them are racist and are just not good people. A pretty wild number to throw out there, but hey, his words, not mine. He also mentioned that he believes Proper had the biggest ego in L, something I can maybe believe, just knowing how great he was at the game, but he also called a bunch of different players frauds, including the likes of Fleta, Edison and Bird Ring. There's a bunch of other players that he called out, so I highly encourage you to look over the recap. 
While we're in Hydron mode, I thought I'd bring up Gunba, who immediately went on Reddit to make a response to all of these allegations. Here's a quick list of some of the things he said. For one, he thinks it's kind of funny that Hydron would be talking about how he's a bad person, when Hydron himself has bragged about how fast he'd get cancelled if people saw his Discord, amongst watching Andrew Tate videos and other things. He also says that the team rarely reviewed until 1am, and would sometimes do those long reviews as punishment, but also do short reviews and end early for good performances as a reward. He also said Xe did play from home, but after falling asleep when a scrim block happened, he was able to encourage him to start coming to practice and improve in person, and he did apparently, before eventually replacing him with Hydron. He also never threatened to kick a player, and said that on the American Tornado side of things, Hydron would actually stream scrim VODs and tryouts to his teammates who were on different teams. And in terms of the Majed Lucio thing, apparently he was a believer at first, but it didn't work out for a variety of reasons, and it's actually the main reason that supposedly the 2022 Mayhem tried to attempt a mutiny at some point. Kinda wild to think that a lot of this stuff went down behind the scenes, but the 2022 Mayhem still managed to be one of the more respectable teams in the West. That's all I'm gonna say on Hydron and Gunba for now, we'll talk about them again later in the video as there's a bunch of more juicy details to come, but for now, just keep in the back of your mind that most of this is just a he said, she said type of thing, and we won't know for sure who's in the right until more people step forward, if ever. Now then, let's move on to the next AMA stream, Albert, the GM of the Florida Mayhem. There's a bunch of juicy details he goes over, it's not quite as dramatic as we saw with Hydron and Gunba, but still very awesome. So, the first thing I wanted to go over is something that we knew about back in the day. In 2021, the Mayhem were one of the main teams competing for MAG to join their roster, alongside the Washington Justice. In his words, they wanted him pretty badly, but in the end, he decided to accept the deal with Washington, and they decided instead to go with OG, who was apparently always their second choice if they weren't able to land MAG. So if you're one of those people who thought they went all in on MAG and then suffered because he didn't join the team, no, apparently OG was always in the plans. Things didn't work out the way they wanted to, but he was their next up. On the topic of 2021 in that disaster year, some other guys that they looked into or even tried to sign include Decay, Edison, Lee J. Gon, Mondu, Closer, Sanguinar, and Teru. And keep in mind that Checkmate ended up winning the job over Teru. He was the next guy in line. Had Teru won the job over Checkmate, there's a chance he never would have gotten a real chance in Florida, and we never would have seen such a magnificent story. So thank you, Checkmate, for your hard work in making this happen and winning the job over Teru on DPS. The Lee J. Gon stuff was also very interesting, as the Mayhem were close to getting him as part of their Season 3 team as well, as part of a package deal with their other runaway guys, Gangnam Jin, Yaki, and Kuki. But unfortunately, the Misfits higher-ups insisted on trying to negotiate the buyout price down, which unfortunately led to Runner, the owner of Runaway, taking offense to them and selling off Lee J. Gon to the Dragons instead. So that's pretty interesting. We're in a world where Lee J. Gon may have never been a champion on Shanghai and instead have been a part of a Florida team that inevitably flopped. Although, it would have been dope to see him part of that 2020 team, instead of Chris, and they certainly would have had an upgrade over Slime, who was on his way out the door essentially with how he played in 2021. Another one of those big what-ifs. But wait, there's more. Albert was very open about some of the players that Florida inquired about and even tried to spend big money on, the biggest of which is certainly Carpe. Apparently in 2020, when Carpe was a free agent, the Mayhem tried to force a bidding war with Philly for him. They wanted to offer him like 400k plus to join their team. That is a ridiculous ridiculous number to throw out there. That is wild that he didn't end up signing with Florida. It makes me wonder how much the Fusion offered him, or how interested he even was in joining the Mayhem to begin with, because that's a lot of freaking money. Then there's Season 6, where supposedly the Mayhem were interested in signing Shy, and they even offered him a 140k deal, which for Season 6 sounds like it's pretty good money. And if you're wondering how that even worked, considering he's Chinese, Swing Chip can speak Mandarin, so they weren't really worried on that front, but Shy obviously was not interested, can't fault him there, but it makes you wonder what could have happened if it was Shy on this team instead of Mera potentially. How different would things have been? Could they have still won the title? Would have been cool to find out. And just, just like a smaller one, instead of Animo, they almost got Langsa on their team, but in the end he chose the Valiant over them. I mean, again, 
doesn't want to come to a foreign place, he'd be the only Chinese player. It totally makes sense on that front, but going to the Valley instead who had like the worst conditions ever is just funny to me. Not for some miscellaneous information that he revealed throughout the stream that's just too interesting to pass up on. So for one, the Season 1 Stage 3 Boston Uprising, despite being so good in matches, were absolutely horrendous in scrims, booming to the maximum, even losing to Florida, and canceling often. I just think that's funny knowing that they were so miserable, and yet they somehow still went 10-0 on regular season games. Not for my favorite part of this leak stream, the stuff on Zephyr. If you're an OG fan, you know about the memes with him and how glorious he is, but apparently there's actually a decent bit of juice on him. For one, on Red, a former coach of Florida in Season 2, was almost fired from the team for insulting Zephyr verbally and threatening to kick him off the team and send him home to South Korea. Bro got yelled at that badly for being trash at goats, but it doesn't end there. The Zephyr and Hagopun rumors from way back when ended up being confirmed by Albert. They almost did get in a fist fight after having an altercation during scrims. Another big detail from the old days that I found fascinating was that the London Spitfire during their playoff run were not just lucky apparently. They weren't just ready to pack their bags and go home and then they miraculously turned it around like the narrative said. In his words, they were actually trying very, very hard, grinding day in and day out with like four scrim blocks a day. It seems that their hard work ended up paying off and it wasn't just a miraculous thing that happened. More so on the mayhem side of things though, during season 2, which was their biggest disaster arguably, when they had their mid-season rebuild, the team was actually split on what they wanted to do. Back then, they had two different GMs, Albert and Barehands. Albert wanted to go in favor of mostly Mayhem Academy players who were just better than their main roster. Plus Envy, at least part of it, with people like Crimzo. We could have seen Crimzo a year early. But Bare Hands basically went behind everybody's backs and signed a bunch of the WGS players that we know today. That ended up winning out in favor of Florida's management. And they ended up trading away their Mayhem Academy players to Valiant shortly after. For some other more miscellaneous information, it's something that we heard about during the offseason at the time. But the Mayhem did offer American Tornado a deal as a package but they all ended up taking their better individual offers, which is interesting just knowing how badly they initially wanted to play with each other, and how it ended up happening just one year later. Aside from Hydron, another individual from that AT core that almost made it to the team was Reiner, as him and someone were apparently neck and neck in Florida's trials for Season 5, but then when Reiner got an offer from the Glads, that made their decision for them. Life works in mysterious ways, just as the earliers of Florida did, when apparently Awesome Guy tried to organize a team mutiny against Albert in Season 2. I don't know what that's about, there's not a lot of details, but that's just hilarious knowing that Awesome Guy of all players, someone who never did anything in his career, tried to organize such a thing and make Florida an even messier team than they already were. Speaking of the OG Florida players, the Fuel were apparently interested in trading OG over to Florida for Tavik at the end of Season 1. This goes to show that Florida were always kind of interested in OG, but also, really? To Vic? Dallas were willing to make a trade for to Vic happen? I really wonder what they saw to think that was a good idea when Florida just weren't good back then. To Vic for OG just sounds like the funniest trade ever, but that's not the only funny trade rumor out there. Apparently Huck, the former president of gaming for Boston that we'll definitely talk more about later in the video, was absolutely impossible to work with when it came to negotiations, as literally right off the bat, whenever they'd make any sort of trade talk happen, he'd say that it would require like 200k plus minimum just to trade for a perma-benched player. That is crazy stuff right there. This man is all about the money, and he doesn't care about anything else or any sort of even trade. Really funny stuff. That's all the stuff I've got on Albert. Again, other stuff, check it out in the description. Now I'd like to talk about Crimzo. He had a brief one, but some interesting information here and there that kind of aligns with some other stuff that we'll talk about later with Punk. But basically, he started off by saying when he was on Boston that Valentine was not very happy when Lori ended up being kicked off the team, their former head coach, and he'd end up throwing scrims on purpose. Eventually, the new coaching told him to stop throwing or just leave the team, and obviously Valentine chose the latter of the two going back to South Korea. 
It's crazy, though, because Boston was very toxic when Laurie was there, and a lot of the players were not a fan of his, and they were miserable, and that's something we will talk about a lot more in detail when we get to Punk, but Crimzo basically said that he made it so that the Westerners were very segregated from the Korean players, and they were consistently kept out of scrims and reviews, and there was just never really a chance to play, and it felt kind of lonely and weird and boring, and it all got to the point where Crimzo went to management and demanded that Coach Lori be fired or that he himself would leave the team, and it just so happens that later that day, Lori was off the team. That was the last straw. Crimzo was on so many different teams with crazy drama, and I can't think of a better place to move to next than talking about the Decay situation. He didn't go over it that much in detail, which is a shame, can't blame him though, but he did say that the Dallas players generally did not get along with coaches, and that alongside COVID played a massive factor into the Dallas and eventual Decay situation. And once the Decay situation happened, both with the aftermath and all the drama that was caused beforehand, Dallas were just mentally boomed beyond repair, and that's part of the reason they just sucked so bad the rest of the year. And it didn't help that they weren't getting a lot of assistance from some of their roster, as a bunch of their guys were just busy playing Valorant during the season. And that lines up considering guys like Zachary, Unko, and Trill, and AKM would all leave and just be perma-benched anyway. He also alleged that some of those guys made it even worse by supposedly leaking comms and scrims to other teams so that Dallas could lose. 2020 Dallas sounds like quite the experience. I mean, bro said at one point he broke down and cried mid-match on this team due to the stress during the year. That is horrible, and I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. Dude's just trying to pursue a career. This was the only offer on the table, and this is what he had to deal with. Luckily, things would get a bit better on Houston and Vancouver. Speaking of Houston and Vancouver, he did bring up some details about them. One is an ever so popular name that goes by the name of Jangu. People always wondered why he didn't get another chance and why he got benched. And in Crimzo's words, they ended up picking up Dreamer over him because Jangu's English was very, very bad. That makes sense, very understandable, and maybe it's part of the reason that nobody would pick up Jangu later on. As for Vancouver, he said the vibes were really good over there, and everybody was very happy. And after the Aspire situation happened, the team actually recovered very quickly, and that's great to hear. And lastly, if you're wondering what teams were interested in Crimzo throughout the years, well, in Season 3, Dallas was like his only offer, like I was saying, but then in Season 4, there was actually a bit of a contract battle with the Gladiators and the Houston Outlaws. Both of them had some interest in Crimzo, but they were waiting to see where Shu and Moth would go. And in the end, whoever didn't get Shu was gonna get Crimzo. Now, I don't remember if it was Crimzo stream or somewhere else, but I believe I remember reading that Shu was very interested in going to the Hangzhou Spark during this time but that didn't work out for whatever reason, so he chose the Gladiators instead, and that meant that the Houston Outlaws would end up having to go with Crimzo instead of signing Shu, who they'd get two years later anyway. Another guy that got into the whole stream juice thing was Gooshway. He turned on his stream shortly after Owl ended to talk about some stuff that had gone on throughout his career, and some of it is fascinating. First things first, Gooshway is actually the one that said that Shu is the one that wanted to come to the Hangzhou Spark back in the day. There were rumors swirling around back in 2020 that Jonek might come to the Spark as well, or like 2021. That never ended up happening, supposedly. But Shu actually desperately wanted to come to the Spark. So it's just so interesting to me that one of the best flex supports of all time, in some people's eyes arguably the best, was not picked up. He said, yes, I want to be on Hangzhou. That was his dream. And in the end, they wanted MCD over him. That might be one of the greatest blunders in the history of professional Overwatch. Willingly choosing MCD over Shu is crazy. Supposedly, the Spark coaching said that MCD had more room to grow and be a team leader. He had more potential and that Shu's growth as a player should be over. That is insane looking back at it. And at the time, apparently they played favorites with MCD. There were a lot of Spark coaches, and they all listened to him no matter what he said. They trusted in this guy, and they thought he was going to be the guy to lead them to the promised land. So much for that, huh? Supposedly back during that time in 2021, it was pretty messed up between the Korean and Chinese talent. Back then, it wasn't as much of a split. 
the coaches were very focused on the Korean players, and they just had this weird obsession with MCD. I don't know what it was, but they said, they literally said this to Gushue. They said that if you listen to MCD's instructions and you understand him, you'll have a 40% chance of winning the championship? Like, what? What is this weird obsession with MCD of all players? What is he, the next coming of Christ? No wonder the Spark arguably had their worst season that year. They were completely segregated, and he even mentions that, saying there was basically no communication between the Korean and Chinese players, and they were commonly separated to do their own reviews and practice and whatnot. And that's just horrible. There's no way you can survive that way, and I wonder how something like this even happened to start. Sounds to me like the coaches almost had a chokehold over those guys, because the Korean players were kind of scared to even interact and hang out with the Chinese players. They didn't want to cause trouble and get yelled at by the coaches, which is absurd. Those are your teammates. I mean, they had such an ego that they thought they were better than the Shanghai Dragons with their fully Korean team. The championship winning Shanghai Dragons. Get real. But apparently, one bad experience with Korean coaches was not enough, as in 2022, they had Changun. And if you know me, I've never liked the guy a lot as a coach personally, but it goes way beyond his weird style, as a lot of it doesn't even have to do with strategizing. He said that Changun would simply play favorites back then, and he'd swap out certain players simply because he didn't like that player. He'd rather have a random player like Architect off-rolling, rather than having certain players on their main role, because they simply did not fit in, and he didn't like the way they played. And considering some of the weird stuff he's done in other seasons, it kind of correlates. Now for the final AMA stream that we're going to highlight in this video. It's a quick one. It's Xerneas, who just had a few tidbits of information that I wanted to share. One is that he earned about 273k from his Overwatch career over the years, but apparently he spent about 54k of that on Genshin Impact. That is a mind-blowing amount of money to spend on a video game, but apparently he doesn't have much money left now, and he lives with some sort of friend. That's the unfortunate nature of esports careers and sports careers in general. Sometimes people misspend like that, and they don't know any better, and it seems like Xerneas may have been a victim of this. And if you remember, back in 2021 during Chengdu's Prime, there were some rumors floating around that he got benched for not trying and then reading manga and playing Genshin Impact, but apparently there's more to it than him being lazy and having a bad attitude, as a lot of players just weren't treated fairly by Chengdu in his words. Apparently, the top players on the team, whoever that is, probably like Leave, Monk, and Gaga if I had to guess, were favored by management, and then management would take out the rest of their frustrations on the bottom players on the team, and he happened to be one of those guys. So, in return, because he felt like he wasn't being treated the right way, he started reading manga, and only started after he became a sub. And apparently, I mean, we all kind of knew this, but in his words, there was a lot of stuff that went down behind the scenes with Chengdu that was pretty miserable, and I believe other Chengdu players have confirmed the same thing, but he got into an argument with Late Young at one point, amongst the fighting with management and with coaching, and eventually he was forced to apologize to Late Young, or he'd end up missing out on some monetary incentives, he really had no choice, he did it against his will for the bag, understandable. As it turns out, and you'll keep hearing this throughout most of this video, a bunch of team environments aren't as nice as they sound behind the scenes, no matter how successful they are. And to wrap up, I'm not going to put too much comments into it, because again, it's one of those he said, she said types of things, but Coach Nohill at one point in the stream came in and said that D-Pay got sent intel on the Hunters comps before their Countdown Cup matchup in 2021. D-Pay has since denied that, again, you really don't don't know who's in the right or wrong there, and I don't even know how much it matters because you know what Chengdu are going to play anyway, but regardless, this is something that allegedly happened. Now we're going to get into the podcast section of the video, and damn, the juice goes to an entirely different level with some of these videos that happen. It was all done on the Uncoachable podcast held by Unter, Commander X, and of course, Christopher. You should definitely subscribe to their channel, link in the description. They come out with some crazy 
crazy bombshell episodes where people just let loose. The best one, most certainly, is the one they did with Punk. This guy goes in on his time on Boston and what it was like being coached by Lori as well, like I said. So let's dive straight into it, starting from the beginning when he was on the 2020 Boston Uprising. In his eyes, it was miserable being on that team. They sucked. There was nothing to do. They're in the middle of nowhere, apparently. He put on about 15 kilos. And at one point, Myungbung and Jerry just gave up. And with how bad Boston were, with how hard they tried just for it to be to no avail, can't exactly blame them. But then things get crazy after 2020. At the offseason before 2021 happens, Huck came up to him and said they were going to keep him, Fusions, and Color Hex, then add in the WGS Phoenix players. It was going to be sick. And in Punk's eyes, that sounded great. A chance to improve and have a better team doesn't get much better than that. But boy, was he wrong, because immediately he found out right from day one that Coach Lori was an awful person to work with. He comes onto the team and basically acts like Boston or the goddamn military. It's brutal for so many different reasons. I mean, where do we even start? How about the fact that VOD review sessions would last for up to three hours at a time? And Punk said during those moments, he wouldn't even have time to eat. And him and the team would end up having to do these drills where they'd be planking or running outside if they couldn't understand what they did wrong. He would demand these guys go down into a plank position if they didn't get it. That is unreal to demand that of a guy playing a video game professionally. And on top of it, during those VOD reviews, there was verbal abuse going on constantly, calling people names, being extremely rude, the whole nine yards. And it wasn't just verbal abuse either. Apparently one time, I don't know how hard, but he hit Faith in the back of the head. Like, what? How did this dude not lose his job immediately? But oh, it gets better. After all of the review happened in a long day of practice in scrims, the team was forced to play ranked until 3 a.m. on the dot, and he would come into the practice room to make sure the players were there until 3 a.m. We're talking 15-hour days, six days a week, one day off. How could anybody perform well over that type of pressure? I mean, no wonder the Boston Uprising were a mid-team in 2021. They were getting punished and worked into the ground all year round. And it gets better too, because knowing that Lori came from WGS, he played favorites with certain players. In particular, Valentine got very special treatment, and he loved to play favorite with him. He recalled this one story, and it was absolutely hilarious, where they were scrimming Boston's academy team to try and improve their attack on Gibraltar. They were really bad at that map during that time, and Lori would end up swapping out each player individually from the Boston team and the academy team to see who the problem was. They put Punk on the other team, then I'm 37, all those guys. And every single time, the academy team was winning. That was until they decided to swap Valentine onto the academy team. And immediately, they won right away. Bro went through every option in the world just to still not realize that his golden boy of a son was the reason they weren't doing well on Gibraltar. And even then, he just could not get it in his head after seeing the results. Punk said they played Watchpoint Gibraltar 18 times until 5.30 in the morning, trying to figure out what the problem was when it was obviously Valentine. Lori clearly was not very good at managing his players well. Him and Crimson can both attest to that. And it gets better too, because it wasn't even just him that was the problem. Mineral back in the day was an issue too. Back during 2021, when Punk had a 1 plus 1 deal, Mineral threatened to sign another tank to the team if he didn't show loyalty to Boston and sign for an additional year heading into 2022, and even after he did that, feeling like maybe he secured his job, they signed Gabe Bolsey anyway. And this would only be the beginning of the long arc of trying to replace Punk as we all know, and it always failing miserably. I mean, I can only wonder how these guys put up with this for so long. All of this horrible abuse, going into plank positions when they did something wrong, running laps around the apartment block, and still somehow no one being suspicious in the front office. 
And after that, everyone said enough's enough. In 2022, for the guys who stuck around, they stopped caring and they stopped listening to Lori, stopped doing what they asked of them, and that was it, because he was a jerk. And at one point, he even had a big argument with Stryker, and we all know that Stryker doesn't have the best reputation at times, so that didn't end too well. There was a big explosion there, and Stryker would end up leaving the team soon after, all because of Lori, rather than somebody like Huck, like some people may have thought behind the scenes, such as myself. And that was supposedly the final straw. We talked about the Crimzo thing before, how he threatened to leave the team, and it would seem the team got their way. They wanted him off the team, they asked management, and they kicked him off. That was that. No more power for Lori. Get him out of there. Earlier in the Crimzo section, I mentioned how Valentine would throw, but apparently, in Punk's words, MCD was also a part of it. Not so much because of the Lori thing, but because he wanted to stick around with Valentine. That was his boy or whatever. So, yeah, those guys decided to troll and throw because their coach was gone, and Valentine ended up going home, and I guess MCD was a bit better after that. I mean, Punk's tenure on Boston sounds like one of the biggest nightmares of all time, and this dude was stuck there for three years. He was on a miserable team, then on two Lori-led teams. I mean, it just doesn't get any worse than that. Well, actually, I guess technically it can because Huck was in charge for a long time, and Punk has gone on record saying that he never liked Huck right from the beginning, understandable, seems like a lot of people have that opinion. I believe most fans throughout the years, just from rumors we've heard, had an inkling that Huck was maybe a little suspicious behind the scenes, and Hunter confirmed that him, Mineral, and Boston were pretty famous for lying back in the day, and Punk backed that up by saying that Huck straight up lied to him way back when he was trying to get signed. He said, and at least Huck I should say, said that he had a spot on the team when he turned 18 at the time, but he'd end up not signing Punk until about halfway through 2020, when the team literally had no options left, they were pressed for time, and they lost a bunch of off tanks, and tanks in general, in a very short amount of time. It seemed like you could never have job security no matter what, and that you never knew when it was going to end. Punk said that Huck and Boston were consistently looking for the next big thing to add to their team, and that seems to reinforce the idea of them trying to get lucky with a budget roster. They're always looking for that famous guy they could pick up out of nowhere, they got lucky with Stryker, they were trying to find their next Stryker, but it just never happened. And just before getting off the Punk wagon, as well as the Lori stuff, Punk did go on to confirm the stuff that Crimzo said about the Western players on Boston being in a segregated area while the Korean guys practiced and scrimmed and did VOD reviews and whatnot. And at one point, Boston decided, along with the benched London players, to form their own scrim team, you know, just to stay sharp, practice, and to say they can play. And on this team with a bunch of random London and Boston guys riding the bench, Punk would end up defeating Boston in a scrim, their main team without him, when he was benched for MAG when they initially traded for him, and that is hilarious. Oh, and speaking of MAG, he wasn't the only guy that Boston were interested in back then. Supposedly, they wanted to get a lot of the Washington players when they were looking to sell the team around the halfway part of 2022, but they'd only walk away with Mag. They wanted to K and all those guys, but it just didn't go through for whatever reason. But thankfully, Boston came to their senses, got rid of Lori, played Punk again, and they immediately started playing better, and in Punk's words, they saw a big-time morale boost, and the team even started to loosen up and have more fun together. And just to round out everything, during his time on Vancouver, he had a couple of stories. One, kind of like what Crimzo said, the vibes were way better, way more enjoyable. But also, he unveiled some information about their potential replacement for Aspire. Before learning about Hisang's availability from the Shock, they were considering both Sharp and Venom to be their new DPS player. Very interesting choices. So yeah, that's the Punk Uncoachable episode in a nutshell when it comes to a lot of the bombshells. Not everything, there's a bunch of stuff that I left out, so definitely recommend watching this episode. It's like the most entertaining one for sure. But now we're going to move on to the next episode synopsis, so to speak, in terms of the big information. Let's talk about Gunba and Hydron Part 2. First, they had Gunba on the podcast, and he had some stuff to say. He kept the Hydron stuff short and sweet, but he did say that him and American Tornado are a bunch of chokers. 
He again confirmed that Hydron streamed his tryouts to his American Tornado teammates, and overall he regrets signing Hydron, and that he couldn't see his choking tendencies in tryouts back in the day, and yet still sign him anyway. That's crazy to say, that you regret signing someone for choking way back then. And he also mentioned he had a lot of problems in general with Hydron, and that's mainly the reason why they signed Exe. That kind of aligns up with Hydron's story, not totally, but the correlation is there. Exe was the common denominator because he did not like Hydron in his attitude and what he was doing, and vice versa. Then there's the whole mutiny thing, when some of the players were getting tired of how Gunbo was treating them in the whole Majed Lucio situation, apparently Hydron and Sir Majed orchestrated a potential mutiny to try and get Gunba kicked back in 2022, but Albert would end up sticking up for Gunba to keep his job, and in the end, I think he's pretty happy with that choice, knowing that they'd win the title one year later, but it's clear that some of those guys had some big time animosity towards Gunba and his coaching style and how he treated them, that they wanted to get him fired before that season even ended. It's crazy to think they kept it together and they still won as many games as they did. Aside from that, he didn't have that much to say on Hydron, at least from what I saw in the podcast, but there's still some other information we can go over. He doesn't have as many juicy leaks as like Punk, let's say, but there's some interesting stuff about his mindset and rumors and stories and whatnot. So the first thing that I found fascinating was that he was very particular with who he wanted on the floor to mayhem. He did an age screening of talent back then, where anyone above the age of 21 with no real achievements was basically basically just out of the conversation immediately. He wanted people who showed the results or young players that could be molded and unleash their full potential. He had a philosophy and in the end, it worked. That's basically all the juicy details that Gunba released, at least in my opinion. There's other stuff, but you can check it out for yourself. But before I get through the Gunba section, there is one other detail that I found fascinating that I wanted to share, and it has to do with the Gladiators. Unter said that their team in the 2023 offseason did not get their budget until later than the other guys. So by the time they could make moves during that free agency period, a lot of players were already signed and off the boards. And it makes you wonder, because the Gladiators did spend more money than certain teams, how things could have gone for them if they maybe signed some more marquee free agents. Maybe their team could have been better and they wouldn't have missed the play-ins epically like they did. Now we go from one side of the argument to the other once again and talk about Hydron who recently joined the Uncoachable podcast and he also kept it pretty short and sweet when it came to the Florida stuff and Gunba but there were some details that he revealed that I'll share with you now. One is on the 2022 Florida Mayhem Mutiny. So at the time, Hydron felt that the players were not being listened to by Coach Gunba. And apparently, Hydron wasn't the only guy who started said mutiny alongside Majed. He was mostly a spokesperson and the guy that would go to address these issues to Albert because all the other guys on the team couldn't speak great English to him. So it seems like on the surface, he's the forefront of it all, but there's more to it, at least in his words. Also, more so on the Gunba stuff, he said some of his responses on Reddit were just flat out lies. The first being the whole review reward punishment system. That was not a thing, where sometimes they'd get off early, and the only sometimes were going till very late. Hydron said that those harsh reviews happened almost every single day. Again, two very different disparities, don't really know who to believe there, but it seems that the players have a different story of how this went. And overall, he felt like the Mayhem guys just didn't have any input on some of these decisions both with lineups and feedback, and of course with Gunba apparently trying to get rid of people by himself with no feedback behind the players' backs. And apparently, in the end, he changes ways in 2023 to be a bit more bearable. That's in the words of some of his former teammates. But in general, Hydron believes that Gunba is a terrible human being. He still stands by that he thinks he's racist. And apparently, Gunba would remind the team a lot of the time that they weren't going to win anything in 2022. It's true. I think they all knew that. But that's just not something you say to their players. It got to the point where he said, why do you guys care during tournament matches when they were losing? Because they sucked. 
a pretty wild thing to say if true. And in the end, Hydron was just so sick and tired of being with Goomba. He generally thinks he's like the worst person ever. And he told Albert straight up during the offseason before 2023 that he would not be re-signing with this team if Goomba was still there. Obviously, Goomba won out and that was that he packed his bags to Toronto. And that, at least for now, is where the Goomba Hydron epic tale will end. But Hydron did add a couple of more key details in this podcast that I wanted to bring out. One is that he said Toronto were supposed to be a player-led team. Kasaurus has backed this up as well, but nobody really led them. They didn't have that leader, and he believes it would have been helpful if they had a guy like Reiner on their team. He also revealed that Speedily wasn't in it to win it back then. Despite being such an exciting prospect, he just wasn't practicing and staying that motivated outside of scrims, apparently more so playing Valorant in his spare time more than anything else, which probably is part of the reason he did not perform up to standard like a lot of people thought he would. Hydron also went into detail to confirm some of the stuff that Gator had already said about why Team USA failed, and then of course he went into the glory days with American Tornado in their primes, and there was one story that I just thought was fascinating. Supposedly, in 2021, American Tornado would dominate all teams in scrims. A lot of it was them not really trying as hard, or not playing against the comps they prepared for, but still, it eventually got to those guys' heads, they were really confident, and honestly, they were really good scrim partners because of that. They were in high demand because they were beating these owl teams. Supposedly, a couple of teams were getting into bidding wars to scrim them, like paying them like a hundred bucks on the sides to do a scrim, which is a pretty sweet deal, and I'm sure that was a big way to increase their confidence to be in demand like that. Now I'd like to move on to the Gator segment though. A lot of what he talked about didn't necessarily have to do with the 2023 reign, but more so like some perceptions and cultural stuff with Korean players in particular. One thing I found fascinating was that he said Korean players are very set in their ways from his experience and that his group always wanted to dominate scrims and would basically refuse to experiment when Gator would ask them to try a Ryan comp or something else. They just wanted to win all the time and they couldn't understand Dan trying to experiment and lose. All they wanted to do is win. And maybe that's part of the reason they'd end up flopping later on in the year, because they just weren't as practiced at the other things. Gator made it pretty straightforward. Korean players have their mindset on something, and once they do, they'll keep doing it until they are proven wrong. He even recounted a time when he was playing with Pelican back in 2021, where the team would have to lose horribly in scrims to prove him wrong on something, and Hunter, who was a coach at the time, even said this was true. Korean players apparently just hate losing with a burning passion. Hunter even said that Pelican would get mad over losing like one scrim, despite them dominating like all the others, just going over all the things they did wrong and saying this player sucks we need to replace him with him gator needs to be replaced with mag hawk is worse than fury like all this super hilarious stuff just for losing one scrim when this team made the freaking grand finals in the end Korean players are hyper-competitive, they want to win. But it doesn't end there, and this kind of seems to back some of the stuff Hydron was saying about a lot of Korean players not being as nice as they seem behind the scenes. Gator said it's actually very common for Korean players to talk trash behind their own teammates' backs when they're doing poorly even messaging the enemy team mid-scrim, saying how these guys suck and laughing at them. That's wild. It goes to show that even some of the best teams don't have the greatest situations behind the scenes. And it's a common theme that we've seen throughout a lot of these entries that team environment is everything. Having a good culture and a good team vibe is super important over the course of a season. If everybody's too locked in, it can become a problem. And it would seem that 2023 Atlanta even fell victim to this, not just with the scrim thing and not wanting to experiment, but also not having confidence in themselves the moment that something went wrong. Supposedly Atlanta, mind you, they're undefeated in the regular season at this time, were not doing great in scrims leading up to mid-season madness like the week before, and suddenly they were convinced that they couldn't win it. The best freaking team in the Sombra Dive were convinced they weren't going to win it. They were more stressed than anything else. It wasn't even a, yeah, we did it, great job, guys. It was more so of a, thank God that's over with. And that's just a horrible mindset to have. It's just too stressful. And that might eventually be part of the reason that Atlanta Reign ended up having their poor performance at the end of the year. Speaking of that mid-season aspect, Gator went over that as well. 
saying that when that slump happened, it was pretty clear that Hawk needed to come in and play, as he's just a more versatile tank player than somebody like Dunghack, but between him, Hawk, the players, and everybody else, they just did a poor job of integrating Hawk into this team. It didn't feel like he truly belonged, and the players were even afraid to bring up criticisms to his face. They were afraid to. They would come to Gator instead to, you know, relay the message, if you will. It seemed like a very strange environment. It's rough that a guy they had planned on having on this team from the beginning never felt like he was truly welcomed. Just a sad thought for sure, and maybe under different circumstances, Hawk could have been a better difference maker for them. Again, man, it's this vibe of having a good team environment to succeed. It's good to have competition and to want to win, but having a mixed roster seems like the way to go. That's what Gator and a lot of the guys agreed on. That having an English speaker or two in there with the Koreans just changes the culture up, it makes it more chill, gives the team more personality, and it becomes just a bit less tense. You really don't know what goes on behind closed doors with some of these teams, and why they failed or succeeded, or how they almost failed or succeeded. And once again, we got into this conversation that Westerners' perception of Koreans on the outside looking in, of them being nice and innocent, is pretty false. Both Gator and Christopher backed up Hydron in this aspect, even saying that they believe Western players are less toxic as a whole. That's up for you to decide if you believe it's true, but I found that very interesting. And Gator actually brought up an example to support this claim, saying that oftentimes older Korean players will treat their younger teammates not nearly as good in a much less respectable manner. Gator even acknowledged that oftentimes he would see Dunghak in the team crying, literally. This guy, this 17 year old kid, not even a full adult yet, was crying over the way he was getting verbally abused at times apparently behind the scenes brutal stuff, and it makes me feel bad for Donghak. That was a high-pressure environment he had to go into, and that's some of the stuff he was dealing with alongside the additional stress. The final thing I wanted to acknowledge doesn't actually have to do with Atlanta or Gator, but it's very fascinating. It has to do with 2023 Boston. As we know, things were pretty up and down for them, especially at the start. They were having issues with their coaches, and literally during the mid-season Madness Tournament, Gator said that Boston had a mutiny against their coach. The players literally banded together to kick Coach Dongsu off the team. And this is the day of the midseason madness. They are in Korea and they kicked him off the team. They played without a coach for those matches. They had no one. Supposedly, Coach Dongsu, who, mind you, didn't even know Wizard Young, apparently approached him in the Atlanta part of the stadium asking for advice on what to do. That is absolutely wild, and it makes you kind of feel bad for the guy. The Gator episode just has so much insightful information, maybe not as much juice as other episodes, but they go into so much detail about some interesting points, so definitely check it out. For now, though, we'll talk about the funny Astro episode, and this one's great because both Astro and Hunter were a part of the Gladiators in that collapse, and they both recalled what happened. Supposedly, Lastro did quit on the team mid-season, but the Glads never bothered to announce it. He was already very upset with the team to begin with for one reason or another, but once Dante left, that was his breaking point. And losing both Dante and Lastro in retrospect were just horrible. Dante was always the scapegoat for the team, and he never stuck up for himself, apparently in Hunter's words, and they regret letting him be the scapegoat. As once Lastro and Dante were gone, they lost any real understanding of how to play Rush on that team. Lastro and Dante were the only good players with that, supposedly. So without them, without that understanding of the push and the pull, so to speak, of how those comps work, they just fell apart and they couldn't play it. But I'll be damned if that's the only reason why this team failed. A lot of it had to do with coaching problems too, as Coach Smash had a lot of input, but his style and approach just didn't align with everybody else. The Glad's coaching and VOD review style, in Hunter's words, was just too much about positioning and angles, and not enough about the common themes that could help this team improve as a whole. Funny enough, Astro says there really wasn't any drama with the Glads. It more so just felt depressing and that they didn't know what they were doing. The office felt boring overall, there was not a lot of life unlike the Season 5 team, and most of the time Coach Smash was just telling the players how bad they were at the game. And obviously, that's eventually going to take a toll on your mental. But if you think 2023 was the only depressing year for the Gladiators with this core, you'd sadly be mistaken. 
According to Unter and Funny Astro, even the Season 5 Gladiator's atmosphere was miserable, and the culture was god-awful, and that's despite of them winning a lot back then. And supposedly, quite a few players in that core were part of the problem. Unter himself even called Ants, Reiner, and Patty Pan the holy trinity of mental illness. Quite the bold way to describe your players. You have Patty Pan, who did his own thing during scrims, and he just couldn't focus that much. He kind of lacked interest in practice. Could be part of the reason he quit. But then with him not playing well except during game days, which helped him focus better, it made Reiner upset, and he also didn't really believe in practice or review, which certainly helps. And Ants just apparently was miserable and hated everything. And they'd take it out on each other. I said that Reiner would get pissed at Patty Pan, but then you have Ants and Reiner who would argue and just not listen to each other. When it feels like if they did, they probably just would have been a better team and found more success during the matches. But in spite of all that, despite being a pretty poor team during practice, the Glads just flipped a switch during match time. They were absolutely insane in Season 5. They'd all lock in and look like completely different players. It was almost shocking in Unter size. It's just wild to think that this type of team could have that atmosphere when they were so freaking good. Again, goes to show you that having a good, stable environment with a good vibe can really be the difference between going home early and malding mid-season and winning a championship or at least making it far in the playoffs. Speaking of the playoffs, that is something that Unter touched upon. Apparently, Shu didn't practice that much Kiriko for the playoff meta. He just never wanted to play ranked. So despite Shu being so, so good at Ana, the moment that the meta changed, it kind of screwed the gladiators over. It seems that even the best players on this team had their fair share of struggles that contributed to the gladiators downfall. And I found this all very fascinating in the words of Unter and Funny Astro. Next up, I'd like to highlight the Kasaurus podcast episode. The former, well, I guess I should say current Toronto Defiant coach, former Owl coach. And he started off with some insight as to what happened to the Season 6 Toronto Defiant. The first thing that he made abundantly clear is that Toronto never boomed like some people thought in the first half of Season 6. They actually practiced and worked very hard. He believes that two fundamental problems led to their downfall. One being the meta, which we all could very clear as day see, but also the lack of leadership. Hydron said similar things and a lot of the dots seemed to connect. They were both saying that Kaluge, while good at Winston, wasn't the best at calling shots. He was just never the leader type of tank player. Additionally, Speedily and Hydron were never comfortable in the Sombra Tracer duo. Again, something that was very clear to us, and supposedly that was a weakness that they all thought they were going to have coming into the year. They had too many people on roles they weren't comfortable with, and they had no real leader to step up and make the hard calls. They're all friends, they all like to call each other out on their BS, but they just didn't have that in-game leader, hence why people like Hydron believed it would have been nice to have Reiner on their squad. But then comes the changes after, and some of the stories that are involved with it. And one that I found fascinating is when they're in the process of trying to pick up Opener. What's interesting is that when Kasaurus interviewed Opener, he said that the guy thought he wasn't even good enough to be an owl, literally from Opener's mouth, because he got bullied very hard on Washington the year before, all of those veteran players kind of picked on the rookie, and again, it connects with what Gator was saying about Donghak. It seems that the youngest Koreans on a Korean team like this are just going to be the scapegoats and the guys that get bullied and scrutinized. Thank God Kasaurus was able to convince this guy to come play for Toronto because he ended up playing pretty well for them. Funny enough though, he was not the first option for Toronto. That pleasure actually belonged to Vega. Both the Shock and Toronto were in a bidding war for this guy. He seemed like a pretty good main support prospect. He still does, in fact. He won that winter tournament with Timeless. He's got the skills to be an owl for sure. And Toronto even asked the league if they could sign him. And they gave them the green light. It seemed like everything was going to be okay. It would come down to which team he'd prefer to sign to. But then a third team out of nowhere complained to the league about them trying to sign Vega. And they ended up rule booking both squads. And that meant that nobody could sign him. Essentially screwing over both of those guys plus Vega out of a job. And that right there is a shame, seeing as Vega is definitely an owl-level talent with a lot of potential, and maybe could have made a difference maker, especially for a team like the Shock that heavily struggled with the main support position. 
So yeah, a lot of interesting bits of information about Toronto and their season and whatnot, but Kasoras also quickly went into some detail about his time on the Shock, recalling an interesting story that I believe Nero originally brought some light to in Super's chat, but he talked about it as well on this podcast episode. And he said that the whole Stryker Nero incident happened because Stryker got pissed at Nero for not playing where he wanted him to. I think it was on Noom Bonnie or something like that. Not pushing in the right position as Echo. And that just genuinely made him so mad that Nero would not listen to him. And it got to the point where it kept happening that Stryker just slammed his desk, got out of his chair, and immediately tried to intimidate Nero by standing over him mid scrim. And I think what's the most hilarious thing of all to me is the response. Nero straight up looked at this guy and laughed at him and apparently said something else when Stryker was going to leave and go back to his chair. And that led to Stryker getting so mad that he nearly threw a punch at Nero. The coaches had to intervene to make sure that did not happen. That's like so funny, but also like... Wow. Honestly, seems like both people are in the wrong here. Nero probably could have played in a different position, but also Stryker clearly took it way too far because he has that desire to win and just be the very best. And on the whole Stryker if he's toxic or not aspect, Kasor says in season four at least, he was toxic, as he thought alongside Violet that he was the leader and best player on the team. However, when he came back to the shock in season five, he was one of the best teammates that Kasor has ever worked with. So the whole striker is always toxic thing, clearly not true. It just depends on the year and what version of him you get, which is hilarious. But in season five, he knew this might be his last chance to win a title, and he knew that proper was absolutely better than him. So he put his pride aside and acted like a good teammate. Very interesting hearing the viewpoint of Kasaurus on all this in the whole striker thing. We've talked about it so much throughout the years, and it's just cool to see someone who was actually involved give their honest opinion after working with him. That's about all on the Kasaurus front. So next, we're going to quickly go over a few bullet points that have to do with Shockwave. It was short and sweet with some of the juice, but man, and it hit hard. The first thing to mention is his second tenure on Vancouver. We know that was absolutely miserable, and he confirmed it, saying that they were literally already boomed after like one freaking week of play. Literally after their first game, they were scapegoating Psycho. They thought he was so bad at Genji after just one game that the rest of the team held a secret meeting to talk about him behind his back, and how they thought he sucked, and they needed to get rid of him. One game! It took all of one game to boom. According to Shockwave, that team's coaching staff was absolutely horrible before they got Depay. They offered like no feedback whatsoever, they didn't review that much, and even said when their matchup against London happened that they should just watch what the Shock did and apply it to that game and they'll win. That's the advice they had for their players. It's actually laughable. And for a while, despite being literally the worst team in OWL, they had 10 minute reviews after scrims. That's it. That's what they were working with to try and improve. Shockwave and the guys had to take initiative and try and do things themselves because they had no guidance. They had to plan things out and communicate because they didn't get that assistance. It was just a lost cause right from the start. And finally, we have Shockwave going over some stuff that happened in the earlier days of his career, saying that after 2020, he got offers from both Philly and the Shock to join their teams in Season 4. The two best North American Overwatch League teams from 2020 wanted Shockwave on their team. That's an unbelievable choice to have. Either the league's only dynasty or a Philly team coming off their best season ever with a boatload of talent. Moving forward with the list of uncoachable guests, we have 9K, former coach of the Shock and former Paris Eternal GM. So... He went over some of the stuff that went wrong with the 2023 shock, and the first thing he mentioned is that he believed the team needed a mindset change desperately mid-season. Vindame apparently lost all of his confidence as a player, and the team really wanted a cultural shift with Western guys, hence why they ended up signing both Luke Mino and Renko. He also mentioned some of the struggles that happened at the beginning of the season. We remember how long it took them to move into a team house and all the stress that went along with it. Well, along with that, the team also was kind of set behind the top level teams when it came to practice as scrimming on high ping with Sombra and Brig and Dive was pretty much impossible for them. There was just no way to get valuable practice, so they inevitably got off to a rough start during the year. Obviously, it's just one excuse for a whole season, there's more to it than that, but 
it doesn't help to have that kind of start for sure. Additionally, he went over part of the reason why the shock went fully Korean, and he believes that they went that direction because they felt that maybe they could have actually have won Owl Season 5 instead of getting second if they were fully Korean. That was the mindset of the players and the coaches. If we had just had this guy and that guy, maybe we would have gone over the edge and have won that map 7. And by playing into those what-ifs, they ultimately fell into a trap that would doom them and lead to some disappointment. 9K also mentioned that the Korean and Western players struggled at a lot of points together in Season 5, especially towards the beginning, and it led to a lot of stress for the Korean players. That language barrier was tough for them as well, and that's inevitably, again, why they felt fully Korean may be the better option for them moving forward, just for the sake of player happiness. Eventually, we'd get back on track to 2023, where they asked an interesting question about the tank line, a struggle of the shock, and something that fans often found themselves questioning. And 9K said that part of the reason that Jinbin would end up playing D.Va over Max was because Max actually did not play a lot of D.Va after Overwatch 1, since he was no longer an off-tank. He was not that practiced on the hero like people thought, and Jinbin was genuinely the better option in their eyes, plus they also wanted the versatility of his win as well, so they could pivot back and forth to whatever they needed, hence why oftentimes we see Junbin on off-tank heroes that Max probably in our eyes should have been playing. And last, but certainly not least, is Rack Attack. Oh boy, the Vegas Eternal Avala Juice, what does he have for us? Well, maybe not as much as you'd hope. Rack Attack is a good guy, he doesn't want to go too crazy, but they did pry out some information that we're going to highlight. First things first, Rack did admit that Avala was definitely more involved with the team than anybody expected her to be, even saying sometimes she'd have some interesting and unexpected input during team affairs, like one time where she told him about some mercy tech he could have done in DMs while practicing, and eventually it all boiled over to a point where Empress and the team told her that she's just overstepping too much and she needs to be less involved. And after that, once they went into mid-season break, they suddenly had Korean players on their team. Not much to go off there, but based off of Rack's response, clearly there was something up over there. Rack also provided a retrospective of what it was like being on Vegas and some of the things going through his head now that his career is done there. The first thing he said is that he believes this Vegas roster was a mess up right from the start. Obviously, that's very true. They didn't evaluate their talents nearly good enough, and they ended up having some bad teams both years in a row. But an interesting detail that he revealed, leading up to Paris picking them up halfway through 2022, was that they intended to pick whoever won contenders between Odyssey, his team, and Wisp. The winner of that game was going to be the new Paris Eternal roster. So there's a world, if the guys wake up on the different side of the bed, that Wisp end up being the ones that make it to the Eternal and are the new core. One other account that I found fascinating was some of the comments he had about Malthol, a guy who has been under heavy scrutiny within this community for the last year or so. So he believes that Malthol gets a lot more hate than he actually deserves, and he feels bad for the guy, as he was basically in a really weird spot during the Eternal days. During Contenders, shortly before they got signed, Odyssey needed a Genji player for the Jotes meta in Contender Summer Series, so they scooped up Malthol who they knew could play Genji, and was practically bench riding and retired at this point. Kind of just like a one-time thing, need a Genji player, it'll be cool. But they end up winning the tournament, and then, like I said, immediately get signed to Owl as the new Paris squad. The problem is, they didn't evaluate their talents nearly enough, and then they brought in Malfo when they probably shouldn't have in the first place, as he didn't really have a lot of experience with Overwatch 2, believe it or not. He got that call from Odyssey, the next thing he knows, he's in Owl as a part of the team. He went into a lot of those scrims in Season 6 preseason, barely even understanding the game, having to learn things on the fly. He didn't know about a lot of changes that came with the second variation of the game. Honestly, hate on the guy all you want, but this sounds more like a mishap on the management and maybe even the coaching end to keep this guy. They should have properly evaluated him further, especially after some of those scrims surfaced of the way he played. Yeah. 
maybe they shouldn't have kept him going into season six and they should have gotten somebody else. I blame them for that because clearly based on this information, it just wasn't supposed to happen to begin with. It's almost shocking that he made it on this team. And that essentially wraps up the uncoachable podcast portion of this video. And that means we have finally come to an end. That is everything that I have known and seen in the world of leaks and juice and drama that has happened since the end of the Overwatch League. Again, if I missed out on something important, please do leave it down in the comments below, and it may even make it into a future video. And if you liked this video and you want to see something similar like this in the future, it would mean a lot to me if you could give the video a like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.